Good morning. My name is Peter Salinger, and I am a political science slash international relations major in the class of 2024. Today's convocation speaker is Carleton alumni John Darby, former director of operations at the National Security Agency. I first had the opportunity to meet John last spring while doing research with peers on the state of supply chain security for semiconductors coming out of Taiwan. John was very generous with his time and expertise, though clearly the depths of his knowledge go far beyond what can be shared with the public. John graduated from Carleton in 1983 as a political science slash international relations major with a concentration in Russian studies. He then embarked on a nearly 40 year career at the NSA, culminating in four years as the NSA's director of operations, responsible for all signals intelligence and overseeing a budget in the billions. I will now list a few of the many significant intelligence operations that John has contributed to. In 1990, John worked behind the Iron Curtain on intelligence during the collapse of the Soviet Union, having been stationed in Central Europe during the 1980s. John participated in operations during the Balky, Balkan and Iraqi wars in the 1990s, embassy evacuations in the 2000s, the Arab Spring, 2016 and 2020 election interference, and recently, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in 2022, John contributed to the operation leading to the death of head of Al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawari. Many of you will recall the now famous picture of President Barack Obama and others in the Situation Room at the White House during the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. As they gathered around the table monitoring the operation, John Darby, representing the NSA, was part of that communication network. During his time at the National Security Agency, John received two presidential meritorious executive awards from the US president, two distinguished civilian service awards from the NSA director, and one exceptional civilian service award from the NSA for senior non-executives, for non-senior executives. John is also a passionate mental health and suicide awareness advocate. And perhaps the most important part of John's bio, John happens to be a quote, hell of a good dad. Um, I tell you whether that's his own quote, but that's classified information. Please welcome back to Carleton College, John Darby, class of 83. All right, so we're good, it's all working. Um, so it's my honor to be here today. Um, and I think back to, you know, this is kind of where it all began for me here at Carleton. You know, the very first convo I went to, I was sitting right over here in the bleach, in the, the side pews, I guess, with the rest of the Carleton football team, and I got my first glimpse of Schiller at, at that convocation. So we charged out after Schiller. I really didn't know what was going on and out in the bald spot. and. Uh, we dropped Schiller and it broke. So I say, that's it, I'm doomed. But uh, anyway, so when I say everything started here at Carleton, just to, before I talk a bit about NSA and some of the things that I've done over the years, a few lessons, a bit of some pieces of advice I'd pass on to all you students. You know, soak it all up while you're here. One thing, you know, reach out to professors. You know, they've got a lot of experience and perspective, and you can learn from all of those. There's one thing, if I had to do it again, I would have been more aggressive in that regard. Now, I did learn a lot from the profs I had. Um, Diane nimitz Ignashev taught me Russian. Steve Shear, Poli Sci. Roy Groh in international relations. Bill Whirlin in history. All four of those professors had a huge impact on me. And not to mention Coach Bob Sullivan, the football coach at the time and the influence he had and, and demonstrate, demonstrated the power of positive leadership, which uh, I carried forward for many years after that. So, you know, soak up your, uh, the professors. Um, another great experience you get here at Carleton is, how, is being resilient. You know, life's gonna be tough. There are gonna be a lot of little curveballs thrown at you. You know, and what matters is how you, you learn from each thing and uh, pick up and move forward. Carleton's hard. There's no doubt about that. I struggled academically when I first got here. My first paper, I got back with a big red mark and a D. So yeah, I sailed through high school, you know, A's pretty much across the board, got here to Carleton, got a D on my first paper with a comment said, I can only assume you have no idea how to write a paper. A little humbling right out of the gate. Um, 
so you know, learn from profs, the resilience, the um, relationships you develop here are relationships you're going to have for decades into the future. I mean, I've got friends that uh, I met here 42 years ago, you know, close friends today. And I know if ever I got into trouble, any one of those guys would uh, have my back. And that's it. It takes investment. Um, you know, after you leave here, stay in touch with folks and get together with folks. Even if you have to travel across country, just spend some time with your friends because relationships, in my view, that's what it's all about, you know, in life. Um, and and the, the final thing, probably most important thing I picked up here with Carlton and all of you are getting now is developing critical thinking skills and, you know, asking hard questions and looking at issues from lots of different perspectives. And, and I'm often asked, what's the, the top skill that we're looking for in the U.S. intelligence community to, for new hires? And people are expecting me to say computer science or data science or foreign language folks or whatever. I say the number one skill is critical thinking because that applies to everything. It doesn't matter whether you're NSA, CIA, FBI, State Department, you name it. That is key. And you're getting that here. So what about my journey to NSA? Um, there was no master plan for me to go to NSA. Um, it, it frankly kind of started with uh, the language requirement here. And I took uh, German my first two years and took German in high school, did great, took German here, I sucked. And, you know, I struggled through first two years, the end of my sophomore year, my German professor, Herr Poss, called me in and said, you need to try something else. This just, just isn't working out for you. So I said, great, I'm two years in, now I've got to start from scratch somewhere else. So I wound up taking Russian and, uh, kind of took to it and did pretty well in Russian for the next two years. Um, and I, I, my senior year, I really didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, I, I actually, before my senior year, I, I did apply for and got an internship in Moscow in the Soviet Union in the summer of 1982. And I worked for US News and, Re News and World Report for a few months over there. And I got a taste of kind of the overseas life. I said, I would like to do that and do something, you know, more with international scope. So I was thinking, well, maybe I'll go to State Department, maybe I'll get to CIA, maybe I'll do, you know, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I did go to the Career Center here and read an article about NSA. Really didn't say much other than it was a high-tech agency, and I was like, well, that's not for me because I'm not a tech guy, and, uh, and I moved on. So the, the probably what a pivotal moment that I've shared, and, and I'm, I, this is honestly true, I'm not making this up, even though it sounds like a good story. Um, I was walking from Hill of Three Oaks or Goodhue or somewhere over on that side of the campus back to my room in Seve, and I mean, I had nature call, and not just kind of call, it was like right now you got to find a bathroom and because I knew I wasn't going to make it back to Seve. So I was in front of Laird Hall. I peeled in there, answered nature's call, came back out and was reading on the bulletin board there a notice for a test up in the cities that Saturday for this place called NSA. So I said, why not? So I, you know, buddy and I got a car, drove up to the cities. I took the test. That was, I want to say, you know, late winter term, early spring term, senior year. And by the end of September, I was, you know, working for NSA. Got hired on as a Russian linguist. Um, and from that point on, you know, I started as a Russian linguist, advanced, you know, through various jobs over the years, ultimately to the director of operations for all of NSA worldwide. And basically the responsible official for the United States signals intelligence operations, you know, worldwide. Very cool job. Um, a little stressful job sometimes, but, uh, and at the time, that summer after I graduated, I actually got a job down on Capitol Hill working for Senator Max Baucus uh, from Montana, which is my home state, also a Carleton grad. Uh, I was working for him, and uh, then when I got the job offer from NSA, I was like, well, I really kind of like this on Capitol Hill, but I'm going to get paid a little bit more money to go to NSA, so I'm going to get that extra $100 a month, go work for NSA, and I thought it would be kind of cool working at NSA too. You know, so nearly 40 years later, I wound up making more money <laughs> than I did, and it wasn't just kind of cool, it was a way freaking cool job in, in terms of the things that NSA does around the world. 
So the opportunities I've had really are tremendous, you know, throughout an NSA career. Um, I've worked in over 50 countries around the world. Um, I've met with uh, presidents, met in brief presidents, brief Congress, um, testified in, in court hearings, uh, met with foreign government, foreign intelligence officials, and negotiated deals and agreements with them, um, and, and just really been blessed with all kinds of opportunities. And, you know, through it, and, and Peter mentioned some of the things I've been involved with, um, all very interesting along the way. So let's talk about NSA itself. There's a lot of myths about what NSA is and what it isn't. Um, first, to set the context. So NSA is part of the intelligence community. The intelligence community is made up of 18 agencies. Um, the big ones you know about, CIA, NSA, there's National Geospatial Agency, National Reconnaissance uh, Office who manages satellites. Um, but there's smaller intelligence agencies as well that have a specific purpose, whether it's DIA for military intelligence, Treasury Department, Energy Department, all the military services have intelligence arms as well. They all make up the intelligence community. NSA is the biggest organization in the intelligence community. Um, and NSA is also not only subordinate to the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines now, but also to the Secretary of Defense. So NSA is part of the Department of Defense. And some of those agencies and that broader intelligence community are part of DOD as well. So my boss, General Nakasone, the Director of NSA, had two bosses, the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of the context where NSA fits in for the bigger system. So what does NSA do? Um, there are two main missions that NSA does. Cybersecurity, signals intelligence. You know, NSA is a foreign intelligence agency. What we're doing is directed overseas, not spying on Americans. That the, you know, that there's a narrative out there about NSA does that. NSA is directed overseas, foreign intelligence agency. So for the cybersecurity mission, NSA is responsible for protecting, securing national security systems. So what that means is um, codes to secure the nuclear command and control system, for example. If you see the president speaking on a secure phone, the algorithms there are developed at NSA. So we make codes. And we'll, we put out public information now about cyber, uh, malicious cyber actors and some of the things they try to do and some vulnerabilities in different systems. We'll push that out in an unclassified form out to the public, say that here's how you can protect yourself against foreign actors, whether it's the Chinese intelligence service or Russian service or, or whatever. Um, so that's more kind of a defensive mission. I, I, most of my career, I was in this other mission I'll talk about, but I did spend some time in the defensive mission as well. Now, the other mission, the foreign intelligence mission, that's signals intelligence, or in short, in short SIGINT. So what is SIGINT? SIGINT is made up of three types of intelligence. One is Communications intelligence, that's what most people are familiar with, intercepts of uh, emails, voice conversations, and so on. But also um, ELINT, electronic intelligence, it's basically radars of uh, foreign systems. And then um, what we call FISINT, foreign, instrument, foreign instrumentation signals, basically signals emitted by missiles and so on. So you know, we'll intercept signals from missiles being launched to um, analyze and determine their capabilities, and their, their range, and the like. So all that together makes up SIGINT. So NSA's job in this SIGINT mission is to determine plans and intentions of adversaries of the United States and our allies. What do they intend to do? Um, determine the capabilities that those adversaries have to advance their, their desires, their intentions their conventional military forces, their nuclear forces, their cyber capabilities, their intelligence capabilities, and, and the like. Um, and so learn the plans and intentions, the capabilities, and then provide what we call INW, or indications and warning for how those capabilities intend to be exercised by those adversaries that we have. So all that together. Um, now, how we do that let me back up a little bit about describe what intelligence is. Um, 
the, the analogy I like to use, and some of you may have heard me say this before, is intelligence is much like a jigsaw puzzle, but it's a jigsaw puzzle that's unlike any jigsaw puzzle you and I have ever worked. And this particular jigsaw puzzle, you may have a few pieces on the coffee table in front of you. Some are in the carpet, the dog ate some, some are on the other side of town, some are at the bottom of the lake, some are on the other side of the world, some don't exist. Your job is to find as many of those, piece, those puzzle pieces as you can and put them together to tell the story about plans and intentions, capabilities, I and W. And by the way, you don't have a box top to tell you how they all fit together. So incredibly complex and difficult for intelligence writ large. That's the same thing within in the SIGINT world and how SIGINT operates. We've got you know, collection, collection of the signals. There's processing, which involves you know, breaking codes, for example. Um, there's you know, taking signals and putting them in human intelligible form. There's foreign language processing. There's analysis, trying to piece it all together, what it means and then producing intelligence for military commanders and policymakers, so we can give them the best picture of what's going on with a particular situation. So, the, so there's the foreign intelligence or SIGINT mission, the cybersecurity mission. The bumper sticker we use is NSA breaks codes and makes codes. You know, and some would say, well, that's kind of wacky. Why do you have that, those two missions seem diametrically opposed? Why would you have that in the same organization? And I would say that makes perfect sense to have them be in the same organization because, again, to use another analogy, if you're trying to secure your house, keep out a burglar, who better to protect your house than somebody that makes a living at breaking into houses? So NSA, I'd say we're, we're a spy agency, you know, an espionage agency. We steal secrets, you know, so we break into networks and we, you know, we know how to do that. And, and, how to exploit soft spots and networks and things like that. Why don't you take that knowledge, apply that so we can secure our own national security systems so foreign versions of NSA can't steal those same things from the United States. So that's all, that's kind of the two core missions of NSA. There's another mission that, that underpins everything that doesn't get talked about a lot, but it's, it's really important. And this is about the privacy and civil liberties protections. And this is, you know, I, I get it. We know across NSA, it's a big, powerful electronic surveillance, you know, art ecosystem or capability. And, you know, it's up to us to manage that system in such a way to protect the civil liberties and privacy of folks. It is what I like to say, it's baked into the DNA of everybody at NSA on how, how we operate that way. We, you know, take tests. We all have to take tests on an annual basis about um, make sure we understand the rules, what we can and can't do. We've got a culture of self-reporting. If somebody makes a mistake, we'll report it and capture it. And, uh, you know, we've got all kinds of oversight mechanism, mechanisms as well, both internal and external. Within NSA itself, our Inspector General, our Office of General Counsel, we have a Civil, civil Liberties and Privacy Office within NSA. Um, those are just in a big compliance office, you know, throughout the entire enterprise. Um, we, um, in external, we've got Congress, we've got the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, we've got um, Department of Justice, um, we've got the um, President's Private Privacy and Civil Liberties Board, all of which we're, at, you know, open kimono, and we say, here's what we're doing, you know, and we get uh, reviewed a lot. I, I, I'll read a quote here from you uh, to you. You know, if you recall, gosh, when was it, 2013 or so, the um, Edward Snowden situation when a lot got leaked out and a narrative took hold about NSA was doing all these bad things. Um, and, and the president actually established a review group to really take a hard look, you know, take a look at how NSA operates. One of the members of that review group was a guy by the name of Jeffrey Stone, who's a law professor at University of Chicago. Um, so I'm going to read a quote that he put out after this review. It says, from the outset, I approached my responsibilities as a member of the review group with great skepticism about the NSA. I'm a longtime civil libertarian, a member of the National Advisory Council of the ACLU, and a former chair of the board of the American Constitution Society. To say I was skeptical about NSA is, in truth, an understatement. I came away from my work on the review group with a view of the NSA that I found quite surprising, 
Not only did I find that the NSA had helped to thwart numerous terrorist plots against the United States and its allies in the years since 9-11, but I also found that it's an organization that operates with a high degree of integrity and a deep commitment to the rule of law. I mean, that's how we operate. It, it's, it's hard to explain other than it, it is you know, ingrained to the, into the DNA of all of the folks at NSA that actually deal with what we call raw intercept. Um, so th that's kind of the mission, the compliance and civil liberties, the third key mission that you know, underpinning it all. And the, another role that NSA has is that of a combat support agency. You know, we're part of the Department of Defense. What does it mean to be a combat support agency? Basically means if we have troops in harm's way, NSA is there as well, either virtually or physically with the troops to help them do their mission. NSA deployed thousands of people to Iraq and Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Uh, many of those folks didn't come back. You know, we do have a memorial wall at NSA. Uh, there's 178 names on that wall, uh, people that, that died in the line of duty doing the signals intelligence mission in dangerous places around the world. Um, again, combat support, that's a key part of, of what we do. So who makes up NSA? NSA, you've got, you know, it's this big, amorphous, you know, scary organization, but, you know, underneath that, NSA is made up of people, normal people, everyday Americans, people you'll see at the grocery store, people you see at church, people you see coaching their kids' teams, very diverse group of folks. Um, you know, politically as well, um, you know, lots of different views on, you know, the politics of the world, um, you know, lots of different backgrounds, uh, just a really diverse set of folks. Uh, skill sets, all you can imagine, NSA is, you know, a big global organization. Um, we've got, you know, computer scientists, data scientists, engineers of all types, it's hardware, software, telecommunications engineers, foreign language specialists, um, analysts, de intelligence analysts, security folks, logisticians, finance people, um, you name it, all the skills you need to bring together to operate a big complex organization like NSA. Um, so, the, the, and also NSA is military and civilian. It's not a, so, you know, CIA is a civilian organization. NSA is both military and civilian. So I've worked side by side with military folks from day one when I started working at NSA. Um, and, and I'd say it's roughly, you know, 60, 40 um, civilian to military folks, but all branches of the military are at NSA. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, now Space, Space Force are all part of NSA as well. Um, when I was the director of operations, one of my deputies was a two-star general or admiral. Um, in the military. So we work side by side. We're truly integrated. Um, now, there are people from Carleton that work at NSA besides me. Um, and, and, you know, not a ton, but there are some. And it's really interesting. I, I did a poll to look at the majors of the people from Carleton that work at NSA. Pretty diverse group. You look at the majors, computer science, okay, it makes sense. Foreign language makes sense. History, English, philosophy. Um, you know, just, you know, international relations, economics, you know, all those, you know, pretty broad range of majors here from Carleton and all those folks made their way to NSA doing various jobs at, at NSA. Uh, math as well. Um, NSA, frankly, last I checked, is the number one employer of PhD mathematicians in the country. It's a great place to work for mathematicians um, in terms of challenge and the, the opportunity to make a difference. Uh, Speaking of uh, computer science and skills, and I, I got one for, how many computer science people we have in here? Any names? All right. So I thought about, you know, I'd open up with a joke for the computer science folks, a little tech joke to, about UDP, but I didn't know if you guys would get it. Does anybody understand that? Go look up UDP and you'll see what I, what I mean by that. But I'll explain it. So the computer protocol, there's TCP, UDP, TCPs. You've got to have a handshake between the two computers. UDP is basically you're streaming out. You do this for a lot of the streaming movie services. So you push it out. You're not looking for confirmation that the other end gets what you're sending. It's a joke about UDP. I'll tell it. I'm not sure you get it. Okay. It's kind of sad when you have to explain it. But um, So where is it? So I talked about what is NSA. 
who makes up NSA, where is NSA? NSA's headquarters is at Fort Meade, Maryland, halfway between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Uh, but we also have numerous offices, not just overseas, but here in the United States. And again, just because we're here in the United States doesn't mean, you know, we are focused overseas in what we do. NSA has offices in Georgia, Texas, Colorado, Utah, Hawaii, Alaska. Those are big, significant offices that we have in different places around the world. But the main headquarters there is in Fort Meade, Maryland, which is where, where I was working. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, you know, things I've done and things I've picked up along the way. Um, so I say I started as a Russian language analyst and or linguist, we called them at that point. And my job was to track Soviet military communications. Um, that first job sucked. I hated it. Because basically they, they said, put on the headphones, translate this intercept, don't ask where it came from, don't ask what happens next. You know, it's oh so secret. I say, well, this is really kind of boring. And I knew I could do better if I knew the, the bigger picture and, you know, could work with other agencies. At that point, we weren't, NSA was not working with other agencies at all. NSA was very insular. It was actually most of the intelligence agencies were at that point. Um, and that just, that wasn't, that didn't sit with me. So I actually, I started looking around for other jobs. I thought about joining the military. I was looking at maybe going to FBI or other places. And then I, I got into a program that took me overseas for about 10 years. And during that 10-year uh, period, um, you know, I, I spent a year learning Polish, then went over and served in Warsaw, Poland at the height of the Cold War in the late 80s. Um, that was, you know, that was like you see out of the movies, you know, living in the, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. Um, then I learned Hungarian for a year and went to Budapest, Hungary and lived there for a few years after the wall had come down. So it was really an interesting life experience for me to kind of see living, you know, height of the Cold War, behind the Iron Curtain, and then in a country just coming out from the Soviet domination and as, you know, an independent country. And to walk down the streets in Budapest and I'd see people chiseling off hammer and sickles off of buildings and the like, taking down statues of, you know, uh, Marxist leaders. And, you know, there was a big, uh, park outside of town where they moved all the statues you know, out of the city into this place outside of town so you could go see all the statues if you wanted to, but the Hungarians didn't want them in the city itself. Uh, so that experience kind of molded me going forward. When I talked about my first job, nobody talked with other agencies and we didn't communicate with each other. That experience I had really made me realize, you know, it doesn't matter who pays our paycheck, we're all on the same team. You know, I was working side by side with CI, with State Department, DI, for example, and, and we all had the same objective, we're all on the same team, we just got paid by different organizations. That shaped my mindset going forward that, you know, the phrase I like to use is, you know, we're part of Team USA. I don't work for NSA, I work for the United States of America. And the decisions that I make and the things I do How's it going to help the United States and our allies? Not how's it good for NSA or a particular organization that I'm in with NSA. Um, now, on a macro level, across the intelligence community, that mindset took hold after 9-11. I'll get to that in a little bit. So, I came back um, from overseas, um, back at NSA headquarters, and was working in our 24-7 kind of uh, nerve center, command center. It was where time-sensitive things, uh, you know, where NSA had to respond to something in a you know, timely manner, it didn't have time to call people in or anything to work. So that was my, you know, how I developed a sense of how to deal with crisis management. And this is, you know, one story, for example, was when uh, uh, at the time a cabinet secretary's uh, plane disappeared over the Balkans. This is in the middle of the Balkans War. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember, this was Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown, who was a very close friend of President Clinton at the time, um, very high profile cabinet member. Anyway, his plane disappeared. And we got a call saying the plane disappeared. Can you find out you know, what's going on? Anyway, long story short, in the middle of this, we're trying, scrambling around trying to figure out what's going on. We got a call from somebody who purported to say, you know, I'm in a helicopter, I'm over the water, the, the plane's in the water, and we're counting the bodies. 
Well, as it turned out, the plane crashed in the mountains. There was nowhere near any water. And that was just simply not true, what was being relayed on. You know, the lesson I took out of that was in the heat of the moment, you know, you've got to slow down. You've got to take a breath and realize that information coming in right away is not necessarily always right. So you've got to, you know, and, and that's, I kind of learned at that point and, and working with mentors to say, hey, slow down, take a breath, you know, and uh, we'll work through it. So um, that, that's a skill that really came in handy in the future for me, that crisis management skill. So from then, I went to um, leading an analytic organization focused on Africa. And uh, that's uh, in August of 1998. I got a call in the middle of the night. Said, we need you to come in. There's been a couple of explosions down in Kenya and Tanzania. This is when the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania got bombed. And that was my introduction to Al-Qaeda at that point. I'd heard of Al-Qaeda, but had never really been directly involved in gathering intelligence about Al-Qaeda. Uh, until those embassy bombings <clears throat> um, and I spent a, a good chunk of my career in counterterrorism from you know 9-11 on but anyway had my introduction 9-11 um, anybody that was you know around and has you know conscious memories of it will you know, remember where you were on 9-11 um, my 9-11 story is I slept through the whole thing and that's because I was in Australia on a business trip at the time and I figure I fell asleep right about the time the first plane hit the first tower. And when I woke up in the morning, I was actually gonna travel to another part of Australia that morning, but actually got, turned on the news. I thought there was a movie being made. I, was, it, I didn't really, it just took a while to compute what the heck had happened. Went to the airport, was ready to fly to the next location and got pulled back. All government employees were grounded, you know, for, uh, you know, we were basically frozen because nobody really knew what was gonna happen next. So I got stuck in Australia for about uh, eight, you know, seven to 10 days. I don't remember precisely how long. Um, and I was just doing whatever I could to help the Australian version of NSA, which is where I was, who I was meeting with. How could they help, you know, NSA? And then, you know, we're trying, everybody figured that there was another shoe that was gonna drop. You know, it wasn't just the planes, that something else was gonna happen and what we didn't know. So I came back to NSA. Um, walked into my office and was told by my boss, who I shared an office with at that time, said, you, he said, you have a new job as of right now. You need to report to this other floor in the building. You're now part of the counterterrorism organization. So I went up there and I was basically told, your job is to figure out how Al-Qaeda communicates and build an organization to do that. Go. <laughs> so that was probably the most stressful time in my career in those uh, three months in late 2001 because nobody knew what was going to happen next. Everybody was fearing the worst. I mean, we had threats of a nuclear bomb in Pennsylvania, missiles flying from a trawler to New Orleans. I remember it was at FBI headquarters on a Sunday in October 2001, wondering if that building was going to exist the next day because there was a threat of a uh, nuclear bomb in a suitcase going off in, in Washington, D.C. the next day. Um, so all that, you know, the, the, all these things seem kind of crazy I'm talking about now, but at the time, it seemed crazy for planes to fly into towers. So we didn't know what was gonna happen next. So anyway, pretty intense time. And, and I remember at that point, you know, so, somebody asked me actually, I don't know if it was yesterday, saying what, you know, what are the things that kind of helped you in your career moving forward? And it's, at least for me, it was, being thrust into the counterterrorism organization. It was an opportunity that was before me, and it was kind of a sink or swim moment for me. It was, this was no kidding, high stakes, you gotta do the job. You know, and if you don't, we'll find somebody else in there. So I took it, I basically said, I've been working for how many years to be ready for this moment, to jump into the, jump into the stuff. Um, so, that everybody, I think, in their career, you know, has one, if not more things, you know, things will, kind of circumstances will present an opportunity for you, and you can either grab onto it and know that it might not work out. It can be kind of scary, but uh, many folks will grab onto that, and you'll surprise yourself that uh, you can do it. So counterterrorism uh, went into that after 9-11 and spent, you know, about the next... 10 years doing counterterrorism stuff. 
and involved in all kinds of counterterrorism operations uh, worldwide. Um, the uh, everything from the you know uh, uh, hotel attack in, in Mumbai by the Lashkari Taiva that uh, in uh, when was it 2007 I think or eight right in there to the um, underwear bomber. This is the guy that tried to bring down the plane over Detroit on Christmas Day of 2009. Um, again, the combat support role I deployed numerous times over to Afghanistan and Iraq to help uh, protect uh, the, our forces that were you know, in combat there uh, on the ground. Uh, and probably you know, my final pure counterterrorism job was in 2011. And at that point, I was, you know, I thought what I would say is a career highlight for me. I was the NSA lead for the Osama bin Laden operation, the, the hunt for him and the actual operation that took him down in uh, May of 2011. So um, that was, and for those of you interested, there's a political article that was uh, written about that operation on the 10 year anniversary. And that was the first public what a notification or, or public acknowledgement by NSA that we were part of this operation. So that article is actually pretty good. And I'm saying it not just because I'm quoted in the article, but it really kind of gives a personal sense, you know, from lots of people, CIA, JSOC, different agencies, you know, key players in this, what they were thinking as this proceeded through the hunt itself to find him. Is he really in that compound in Abbottabad bot or not? and then through the actual raid planning itself and as the raid was carried out. Um, and actually the quote I told the interviewer wound up being the, uh, the title of the article, but it's really true. It was by far the most secret operation I've ever been part of, um, and incredibly secret. Um, so much so that even for folks that we had a lot of people across NSA supporting the raid as it was taking place, they didn't know it was about bin Laden. All they knew it was a, the cover story was it was a military operation in Pakistan. Um, but anyway, um, that was, uh, and it, you know, I talked about the first job where um, everything was really, you know, we didn't talk with other agencies. 9-11 um, happened and we shifted to a mode of, we needed to share across agencies. And we, we gradually, well, rapidly developed to a point we have people from different agencies working in other agencies all the time. We've got hundreds of NSAers working at CIA. We've got CIers working at NSA. We've got NSAers at NGA, um, NRO, you know, military commands, combatant commands, and so on. We are you know, in integrated all over the place, and, and we share information fluidly. My last job here as a director of operations, I talked all the time with my counterpart from CIA, from FBI, from other agencies. We really operated as a community. That really um, came, you know, was brought to the attention of a lot of folks with the bin Laden operation. That I would, what I talk about this operation and say, look, if you put the core analytic team that had worked this hunt for a decade, put them down in a row, you'd be hard pressed to say, is that person NSA or CIA or NGA? It, was, it, it really didn't matter. They were all working together with, and with the capabilities that their agencies had to really run this down you know, invest it, put together this jigsaw puzzle, that it may be a, a SIGINT piece, and then it may, you may need a human intelligence piece, or you may need uh, an image or something, but it's all the pieces, how you pull that together. And I was part of the briefing team that went down on Capitol Hill in the days after the operation to brief it to Congress and say how it all played out. And one congressman at one point said, well, if anybody tells me the military and CIA can't work together, our intelligence community can't work together, I'll just point to this operation. And they were saying, yeah, yeah, and they were all um, clapping and applauding. And, you know, it was nice to hear, but in the same, uh, at the same time, those of us at the, you know, table were like, you know, we're talking to each other, say, we do this all the time. You know, really operate as an integrated team. This particular operation was one that got more visibility, and there was a recognition that we do operate as a, as a team. Um, and that team mindset, I talk about, you know, there are people that come to NSA, get hired on NSA, go work down at CIA for a while and realize, you know, I like CIA better. I think I want to work there. And I say, hey, great. You know, we're all on the same team. I don't care if you're smart and you can 
that's a better fit for you too, cool. And there are CIA folks, for example, that worked at NSA, say, hey, I, I like this NSA job better than what I was doing at CIA. Cool, become an nsa -er. Uh So the, the counterterrorism thing wrapped, uh, I, my counterterrorism career, I, I left after, uh, in, in 2011, moved on to, you know, managed a, a joint program with another agency for a while. And then I went to the defensive side of the mission in cybersecurity and was the deputy of uh, cybersecurity operations, you know, on the, that defensive thing. And that really opened my eyes to how fragmented this nation's cyber security policy and procedures are. That at that point, you know, the private sector and the government was not really working closely together on understanding cyber threats. That's changing now a lot. I mean, I, I was appalled at one point there was a, a cyber attack or, you know, malicious cyber, you know, by a foreign government that, you know, it was taking down things around the world and there was no um, mechanism for us to, on a timely basis, talk with the private sector about what they were seeing and what they were doing and how could the government you know, tell the private sector what we're seeing. Because if you look at any cyber threat, you know, there's, that originates overseas, there's overseas, that's where NSA operates, but if they're directed to the United States and they're in uh, U.S. networks, NSA can't see, nor should we. That's not our job, you know, to look at U.S. com. That's DHS and FBI and the private sector, you know, their networks. So how do we, you know, we needed a mechanism to share information across those two sectors, and, and we've gotten better at that now, and um, we still have a ways to go. And uh, it's becoming more, the, the problem is that the government is trying to walk this fine line between what can we suggest the private sector do for cybersecurity and what can we direct the private sector does. And, you know, the government can direct national security, you know, private sector that's working on national security systems to do things, but we can't for, you know, other entities. Um, but we, what we can do out is put advice and guidance and say, here's what you need to do to protect your networks, here's what we're, you're seeing. And different, um, different network owners will operate, you know, give it, I guess, have varying degrees of investment in cybersecurity and defending their networks. That's changing. Um, all of you in here, you know, let me tell you, cybersecurity it's not the government's job, it's not the private sector's job, it's your job, it's my job, it's everybody's job. You've got to start thinking about cybersecurity. Uh, this whole world is wired up right now. Um, nobody thinks a cyber attack will hit them until it does. <laughs> and you'd be shocked at how many of these big cyber events you hear started because somebody, for example, clicked on a link in an email they got. I mean, oh my God, how can anybody do that? How many times have we told people, do not do that? Um, how many, you know, people don't do patches for their networks as upgrades come out? Just do that. Get a service. They'll do it for you. You know, it, just the simple stuff, the basics will protect you. Um, and, and frankly, from a cyber, you know, malicious cyber actor, you know, the analogy I use here is many times if they're looking, trying to conduct ransomware attacks, for example, they're like poking around rattling doorknobs on different network networks. Say, can I get in here? Nope. Get in here. Nope. Get in here. Nope. Get in here. Ooh, here's an opening. Let me pop in here and see if I can put something in that network and lock it out and have them pay me. So do the basics. Make sure you lock your doors because um, that's going to protect you, you know, hugely. Um, so after cybersecurity, then I, I retired, and uh, retired, as they say, I failed at retirement. As a few months after I left, the new director of NSA called me up at home and said, hey, would you consider coming back to be my director of operations? And, you know, I didn't think about it too long, because I think he's the right guy for the, uh, he's a great guy in that job, uh, General Paul Noxsoni. He's from Minnesota. Um, he's a St. John's grad. I try not to hold that against him. Um, but uh, so I, I worked for him for four years as a little over four years as director of operations. Um, so that's uh, kind of the different things I've done in, in the director of operations job. We got involved in everything from you know, how do we 
you know, ensure we protect elections and ensure the you know uh, foreign actors don't get in and, and you know manipulate you know well try to affect our elections and influence them um, everything for you know providing more insight into what the Chinese military and military or, or government are doing in the South China Sea and so on um, to most recently the uh, invasion of Ukraine by Russia and you know part of the the whole and whole of intelligence community effort to push information out to the the broad public here in the u.s and around the world about here's what's coming and the warning that what russia was planning to do and what russia ultimately did do and is doing today so um and then you know just before i left was the strike in kabul that uh eliminated al-qaeda's leader Ayman al Zawahiri, who was the number two for bin Laden and then took over. Um, so, and thus ended my NSA career. So, one of the things, you know, I, I want to leave some time for questions here too. Um, so, I got asked a lot when I was in the director of operations job. As you can imagine, pretty big job, broad scope of things China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, terrorists, drug runners, transnational organized crime cyber, you know, spies, you know, all that kind of stuff it was in that, you know, portfolio. The people asked me, so what was the top priority? And people expect me to say things like, well, it's China, or it's catching spies, or it's stopping terrorist attacks. And I would say that the number one priority, and it's not even close, is people. You know, that people underpin everything. And, you know, one thing I'll ask all of you, no matter what you do, as you leave Carleton and go beyond, Give a priority to people. Give the priority to people. People underpin everything. My job as a director of operations, and I, I, what I ask all of you to take on, is create an environment within the scope of your influence so that every individual feels valued as an individual. You know, it's all, I mean, all of us as individuals have so much to bring to a particular problem. And it's that stuff that makes us not feel valued or that we don't matter that drags us down. You know, we can't unleash everything that's in us to get after a problem if you got all the crap dragging you down. So how, how can you address that crap? You know, you can, as a, within the scope of your control, you can empower people, you can train people, you can develop people, you can talk with people, you can create opportunities for people, you can listen to people. You know, the listening is really important, too. Um, and, you know, Peter talked a little bit about, you know, I'm a passionate mental health advocate um, that, you know, unfortunately, I've lost two of my, both of my brothers to suicide. My wife's lost a couple of siblings to suicide. Um, and I, I talked to a lot of groups about, you know, mental health and, um, and listening matters so much. You know, all of us, life is hard, and a lot of stuff hits us from lots of different directions. Different people react to the same situation differently. A lot of people, they just want to know that they matter, and somebody will listen to them. And I'm not just making this up. I have talked to people who have said, I would have killed myself if somebody hadn't asked me, how am I doing? And opened it up, and I could talk about what's going on. You know, sometimes people, all they need is somebody to show that they care about, you know, it gets back to making sure everybody feels valued as an individual, you know, and it may seem like a little thing to you to, you know, ask how somebody's doing and not just let it, them blow you off and say, oh, I'm fine and move on. Well, if you know something doesn't seem right, press a little more and talk with them. And uh, the phrase, you know, I, I think it's Maya Angelou that said this, and said, you can't change the world by helping one person but you can change the world for that one person that you help. So you have a huge, all of us have a big responsibility, I think, to look out for each other in everything that we do. And I took that, you know, in my, you know, I try to do that in my, you know, personal life as well, but certainly in my professional life, you know, I saw it as the top priority to how to, what are the things we could do, you know, as an organization to create that kind of environment. But it's not just, I just couldn't do it alone, it's everybody else. But I just leave that with all of you to, uh, to think about and ask that you do that going forward. And, and frankly, I'd say people, the impact you have on people, that's the legacy that you leave behind. 
That's people have asked me, what a long career in the intelligence community, you've been involved in a lot of things. What do you want your legacy to be? How do you see your legacy? I said, look, accomplishments are one thing, position are one thing. What matters is the impact that you have on other people because that's what's going to carry on. You know, how you influence and impact other people and then they, you know, carry it on to other folks and pass that on. That is the most important thing in my view for all of us to do. Um, you want an example, you look at, uh, some, many of you know this, a couple of weeks ago, um, the football field was dedicated uh, to Coach Bob Sullivan, who was you know, my coach when I was here. Um, he coached about 600 players over his 20 years coaching. Nearly 200 of them came for this dedication, many of whom had never been back to Carleton until this event. You know, the impact that he had on all those people he came from all over the country, including from overseas, to attend this event and just thank Coach Sully for his impact, that he, the legacy that he had on the folks that, that played for him. And that's a pretty powerful statement there. So just to, to wrap up, I'll say, you know, I, I understand NSA is not a conventional choice for a career choice for Carlton's, for Carl's. Um, it's an option. The intelligence community is there. Um, why have I worked in the intelligence community for so long? It really comes down to three things. <clears throat> Being part of something bigger than myself that makes such a big difference every day is pretty, pretty cool, pretty special. And I've been lucky enough over the course of my career to have been in positions to have seen that happen. You know, people's attacks being stopped as, you know, uh, the ACLU uh, guy mentioned, Jeffrey Stone. Um, you know, and seeing quotes like, you know, generals coming to NSA, do you realize you saved hundreds of lives based on the intel that you produced and the warning that you provided? You realize history got shaped here in this particular event because of the intel that you produced. Um, it, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. So being part of that is, is pretty special. The, the second thing is I learned something new every single day in that job. And you say, how could you possibly do that? You did that job for so long. It's because the world in which the SIGINT system and cybersecurity mission operates is the, is the global telecommunications ecosystem, which some would argue is the most complicated ecosystem ever devised by mankind. That's the world in which we operated. We had to know old technology, current technology, new and emerging technologies. Combine that with geopolitical events taking place. All of that together is incredibly complex legal issues. I mean, I, I joked, I was thinking about going to law school at one point, I might as well have gone to law school for all the lawyers that I met with you know, to work through, you know, uh, you know, Fourth Amendment issues with, you know, surveillance and so on. Um, so that's why I stayed for so long. Um, and the, the final point is, you know, one class of new hires asked me at one point, say, hey, if you had three pieces of advice, what would they be, you know, for us as new hires here? And I hadn't thought about that, but it came to me pretty quickly. And I think this applies not just at NSA, but no matter what you may do going forward. One is be proud of what you're part of. You know, life's too short. Be proud of what you do. You know, how are you making a difference? And uh, if, you know, find a place that you're proud of what you do. Um, the second thing is be curious and ask questions. And don't sit under your laurels and say that's just because the way things are has always been, you know, quest, ask questions, take things the next step. How can you make things better? Be proactive and just don't let things happen to you. Go make things happen. And the third thing is, and the most important, be you. Don't try to be anybody else. You know, don't try to dress like somebody else, talk like somebody else, be like somebody else. Be you. It comes back to that, you know, unleash you. I want the best of you to go out and you know, deal with the problems that the, the, you, that the world faces across the board. Um, so I think that applies across the board. So I'll stop right there and I think we've got some time for Q&A. Thank you very much, John. So yes, we do have some time for Q&A. We're gonna try a different approach. Oh, I have to make my usual tiny, tiny speech that after this, we have the Convo Lunch. If you have signed up, if you've RSVP'd or contacted me, it is going to be in Great Hall this time, not AGH. It's going to be in Great Hall. If you did not RSVP and you would like to join us, still a few seats at the table, please see my friend Beth or my friend Stephanie. There she is. 
if you're interested and uh, let us know. Now, as far as the Q&A goes, we're gonna try a different approach. Some people would love to ask a question. They got a great question, but just can't get that hand up. So we have some paper, we have some pens, we have some people deployed. Maybe you can spread yourselves out a little bit. If you would like your question that way, great. If you just wanna raise your hand and shout it out, I've got a mic and I've got a question. John. Yep. Oops, sorry. Uh, question about politics and uh, the people you talked about. Um, you served uh, for a number of different presidents and a number of different organizations. Uh, what impact does the commentary by politicians have on the human element of your organization? So, well, first of all, I'll say the intelligence community, we are apolitical. You know, our job is to just lay out the facts as we see them. And then it's up to the policymakers to, to decide what to do with that. Now, yeah, if there's commentary, you know, criticizing the intelligence community, saying you don't trust the intelligence community, yeah, that's kind of, that, that's difficult to hear, you know, and it kind of can be irritating too, because in particular, you know, the people busting their butt, you know, to do the right thing. Um, but, you know, we're all grownups and we know that. Yeah. You know, um, and we were just kind of, okay, we'll, we'll take it on and we'll just keep producing the, the facts. And what, you know, one thing, actually, I, m I meant to mention this in my remarks, you talk about politics and um, politicians and, and, you know, policymakers, they're people too. You know, and one, when I was in the counterterrorism job, I used to go down to the White House every week and meet with the president, the vice president, the national security cabinet members all around in the situation room. You know, we called it Terrorism Tuesday, because every Tuesday we'd talk about terrorist stuff. Um, and over time, you know, I'd see all these people you see on TV and the news, and you know, they'd say stupid things, they'd say brilliant things, they'd say stupid and brilliant in the same sentence. And you know, you saw their egos, there's insecurities, their you know, one person was passing around a calendar for other people at the table to sign so she could give it to her granddaughter. This is somebody very well known to every, everybody here. But the point being that these are people in really powerful positions. You know, they're not all knowing. They're just like you and me. You know, doing the best they can with the information that they have at any given time. So there's no, you know, big mystery to, you know, people that operate at that level. They're, they're just, they're doing the best they can. They're just like you and me. Uh, first off, thank you for the talk. Um, I, so cybersecurity, as you know, has obviously been changing. How do you balance things like backdoors and like the defend forward model and like actually protecting the systems? Um, all right, so let me answer this and you tell me if this hits your, uh, kind of where you're coming from. Um, there is a natural tension between foreign intelligence exploiting you know, foreign networks and protecting um, U.S. communications because many of those products are used by both foreign adversaries and U.S. networks. So if on the, we discover vulnerabilities in systems all the time, you know, and there's a formal process, does that get released to the defensive community? or do, does that get held for, it's so important, you know, for, you know, for intelligence purposes not to release that. You know, the, predominantly those vulnerabilities that are found are released to the defensive community and put, and if you look, you know, um, Microsoft when it does its, you know, patch Tuesdays, you know, often, uh, or you'll see sometimes those um, vulnerabilities or patches putting out and they'll attribute it, say NSA found this, um, and to, to ascribe a bit more seriousness to the defender's need to plug this, patch this particular vulnerability. Does that answer your question or? Yeah, what's the process to decide whether it's more beneficial to give to the defense community as opposed to using it for offensive yeah, vulnerabilities. So that, it, that's called the vulnerability exploitation process or the VEP. You know, it's run out of the White House. It was actually put in place at that level by Rob Joyce when he was the national, you know, when he was the cyber, senior cyber advisor down at the White House. He's actually uh, the, in charge of cybersecurity now for NSA. 
but it is an interagency you know, evaluation and process to make that decision. It isn't just NSA deciding one way or the other. And it looks like we have a couple of the hand in sheets, if you could hand them to John. And then we do have, before we do that, John, if it's okay, we have a question. Oh, did I lose him? No, oh, there you, okay, there you go. Hi, thanks for the talk. I was curious if you work with state and local governments um, as opposed to just federal and international because recently there's been a lot of ransomware attacks that are actually being faced by state and even local governments. And I view this as a huge problem. And then there's kind of a philosophical problem with all these outdated systems at local levels. They can be running on like very old, very vulnerable systems. How do you manage spending money to upgrade and also your other you know responsibilities to your community and how you, you know, allocate funds yeah that's a great question so you know nsa you know again we we don't deal with state and local authorities you know we're, we're kind of overseas oriented and national security you know systems oriented what we do work very closely with fbi and dhs so things we find you know we'll pass on to them which then you know, could make their way to state and local authorities. That's really a DHS thing to manage, but it gets to kind of the fragmented nature of the U.S.'s um, cyber policy at this point. We need to find, you know, better and effective ways to knit together the whole of society for, from a cybersecurity standpoint. Does that answer your question? Okay. So the, the written question, so NSA tries to uphold the civil liberties of U.S. citizens what steps does the NSA take to respect the privacy of private foreign nationals? Good question. Um, I will tell you, you know, NSA is a foreign intelligence agency. Any foreign individual that we're targeting is a foreign intelligence, is a, we're targeting for foreign intelligence purposes. It's not, we're not targeting them for any other reason. Now, there are some procedures in place. You know, we just actually negotiated an agreement with, uh, I think, the European Union on some of the procedures for if, European nationals, you know, believe their privacy rights are being violated. You know, what's the procedure and how to appeal that and work that through with the United States. So, um, and, and it, but, you know, there's no denying that the majority of our procedures and processes in place as a U.S. intelligence organization are about protecting U.S., you know, private uh, privacy rights. Now, one thing I didn't mention in the talk, and I, I should have mentioned this, we work, when I talk about working with foreign intelligence agencies, we work you know, day in and day out with foreign SIGINT agencies. There's a relationship we have, it's called the Five Eyes, with uh, the UK, Australia, um, New Zealand, and uh, Canada, you know, and the US. We are, quote, the Five Eyes, and we share virtually everything with one another. You know, our architecture, our, our knowledge, you know, how we break codes, and we're really, we're more powerful together as a group than individuals. And then we'll work with other foreign intelligence services where we find, you know, our priorities may match up, you know, in capabilities. If one service maybe has some language capabilities that NSA doesn't have, we may, you know, make an agreement, say, we'll rely on you for the language capability. We can provide you analysis on, and intelligence on issue X or Y. So there's a range of partnerships, you know, some very deep, some more transactional with foreign partners around the world. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've just run out of time. Thank you very okay. much, John. And if anyone, again, join us. If you want to continue the conversation, talk to us about joining us at the luncheon. We still have room at the table. Thank you once again, John, and thank you all for being here. Thanks.